it's just good to, good to have good to have two people. Yeah. <laughs> we, we flexible. Home for the summer? No, I'm an empty nester. Right, well, yeah, you mentioned that you, something about your son was with you for a while, I see, so he's not. He fell in love. And oh, okay. Moved out. Huh? <laughs> this is good. Now I can get my game on. Yeah. <laughs> wow, it's going to be weird when my kids get to that age. I'll have seven kids in the house for come next week. Seven? Mm hmm. Yeah, I'm crazy. Crazy. well, with mine, and then I've got a. I'll, I'm going to go to a associ county association somewhere down in Orlando next week, and I'll be bringing four kids back up with me. Just are my kids' friends from back when we lived down there, so okay. we'll, have, we'll have a household. Bring it on. Yeah. <laughs> the kids are like dogs, though. The more you have, the more they entertain each other. It's actually easier when there's more. <laughs> right. Yeah, even though he, my son, is so long, longish. Twenty four. It was like, uh, you know, I still felt like I had to keep him entertained. And, yeah. Uh, I'm like, dream of these crazy women. <laughs> That's amazing. Fell into the water head over here. Oh, yeah. Dad, I'm moving out. That's my wife. Well, guys, here we start. We can start. I'm going to start. Are we waiting back to get back again? Okay, you can't. I think he's wrapped up with something, but I mean, I'm going to be doing it, so if you want to go ahead and start, you can. I don't think you would mind. Let's go ahead and say the pledge and have an invocation. Danny, you want to pray for us tonight? I'll be glad to. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Father, Lord, we thank you for this day and all your many blessings. We thank you for each one who's here. And we ask now that as we conduct this business, Lord, that we do it in your will and in the best interest of our citizens. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We will open the meeting. Kristen? Ready? Too hot to work outside, so it's much yeah, easier so coming in. Yeah, really quickly. There's only. Uh, does everybody still have um, this kind of cheat sheet that I handed out last? No.
of the code tonight. We'll get started with chapter one, and we kind of have a combination here. We combined a lot of other um, sections into chapter one, so it looks like there's a lot of addition, but really it's a lot of moving from other chapters because we moved um, chapter six, seven, eight, no, seven, eight, ten, and eleven to chapter one. So we combined a bunch of them. Overall, the land value code is shrinking quite a bit, and, and it cuts down on the possibility that it does different things in different places. So this chapter one is really the administrative section or the general section, uh, and it's, um, so we have in here our development review process, the major minor, all of that. We have our uh, discussion about boards, your, you know, about the planning commission. And I think Heather's got some amendments too. Uh, probably better. ensuring that whatever is built is kind of exactly like whatever is around or and the density issue really does get affected because they can make those kind of work out I mean they just, they're really not uh, they're subjective and not kind of the, the greatest way to do that so the proposal here is to treat neighborhood infill like our other developments so if it's a major, it's reviewed as a major. If it's less than the major threshold, it's reviewed as a, a minor, those same thresholds. Those thresholds are not changed in here in any way for all developments. They, they are the same, there's no change. Um, but to treat neighborhood infill, and there's a couple reasons why we're, we're thinking about this. A is that I think the original intent, intent for neighborhood infill is to have infill residential development. Um, and, and that could be a variety of housing types. And maybe we just need some hard standards for compatibility instead of the subjective um, compatibility analysis. You know, you just say this, this new development needs to be a similar lot size to the <coughs> surrounding development or needs to have certain aesthetic considerations to the building design that make it work. Just flat out hard standards instead of it being sort of a subjective determination by that compatibility analysis. And then also for those to come through the normal development review process. Why do you think they treat it, I mean, what was the, the reason for uh, doing it different start with other than that? Yeah, Maybe fear related to the variable density because it, it allows from four to eight units per acre. Um, it, you, the ones I've seen come in, you know, somewhere in between there, generally. 
Um, so maybe they were concerned, but you know, if you still had, if, even if you went to the current, you know, if you had a big development, let's say they wanted to do you know, uh, some dense apartment or something, that would still go through the major process. So we're really only talking about the smaller developments in neighborhood infill, and it, from a planning perspective, it's, it's kind of okay to allow people to do a variety of housing types, to do true residential infill, to kind of have that missing middle housing. Um, there, it, it's not really great to penalize that uh, through a, a heavy review process. And, you know, last night we talked about it, and everybody seemed excited. We had South Walk Community Council represented there. And, I mean, I think everybody understands that that whole compatibility analysis process is kind of, eh, you know, it really doesn't help as much. What, um, you might not know this, what, what's the difference in the cost from a major to a minor? Yeah, we actually had a couple engineers there last night that were talking about that, and I think we came that it's around, it can be between fifteen and thirty thousand yeah. dollars, not to mention the time. So if you're like this guy here, he's trying to do a couple of houses, um, and he's got to go to three board meetings and um, spend all that extra money, and I mean, there goes your affordability. <laughs> you know, I mean, and you're not able to kind of do any kind of different housing. It kind of, for, Mac had a good point last night that it does kind of force you into being in the development well, pattern. Well, that makes somebody go down, if, you know, in a density to get into a, a minor development order, I mean, without being incentive? No, they would still, they would follow the same, See, neighborhood infill is like special in the I mean, I right now. thinking, but if you're on that threshold, I would it, think. It would be the same threshold that all of our other developments follow. Uh, but I think I see what he said. If, if, I'm, if I own, say, an acre for this one, and uh, theoretically, I could, the threshold is 10 units, anything? Yeah, but I mean, there, there's a major minor 20, 20 lots, 30 multi family units, or 5,000 square feet. So, what he's saying is that there's, if, if I if I do it like 18 lots instead of I could get in as a minor, whereas if I mm -hmm. that's right, that's exactly right. 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 So, and encouraging them to do, you know, that missing middle housing type that neighborhood infill was intended for. I I'm think. saving thirty thousand dollars. Yeah, I, I would think that would be the way to go. I, yeah. I think that I don't see why it would have. I don't see why neighborhood infill has to be special. No. So basically, just apply the same rules to neighborhood infill as you do to anything else. That's right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. wouldn't incentivize. Yeah, I thought. I thought you know, here someone comes up here and wants to put the back and said, hey, let's go down and you can get, you know, got a better chance of getting it. You're done faster and cheaper. Yeah. Faster yeah. and cheaper. Right. Yeah. That, that exists. That, that doesn't, that's, that's yeah, let's what go the current code says with the exception of neighborhood infill. Right. And it says all neighborhood infill proposals are major development. So that does not make any sense. No. So no. I, I agree <laughs> the change would be good. And that's yeah. Oh, yeah. Change. Do you uh -huh. want a motion to that? Yes, and I mean, the other thing we need to just say is if we're going to add those hard standards, because it does have a variable density range. It's from four to eight. So... And y'all could develop those standards and bring those back, or how would that work? Y'all just develop and put them in there. Yeah, I mean, I prefer that, but we could yeah. bring it back. Uh -huh. um, I mean, they're not going to be earth shattering, but they will be something that gives us a little bit of teeth to make sure that nobody puts some in there that's just really not going to work with the neighborhood. I think, that, I think that's yeah. Yeah. yeah, I might do a motion. Yeah. We have a motion? I'll second a motion. I'll I'll motion. motion, we have a second. Any other discussion? You don't want to take any comments from the audience. Let's not start. I didn't get anything to say. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Motion carries. That's really great. I think people, that's going to be better. Uh, the other thing that's in Chapter 1 here that is a possibility for us to consider, um, I noticed that 
we kind of have a fast track process established in the code for affordable housing and right now it's, it's defined as affordable housing and I want to express that there is a difference between affordable housing and workforce housing at a very big difference in terms of the price points of the home and the uh, income of the folks that uh, can avail themselves. Would you mind explaining how way I think because that's a big sticking point between affordable and workforce. They are defined in the statute and um, affordable has different levels. It starts with very low income, it goes to low income. Um, I think there's even extremely low. There's different levels and it's yeah. based on the area of median income. So um, there are certain that would be the section income. Eight, uh, yes, eight. yes, right. And then workforce housing is defined as a different level of median income. So it, it is de truly defined differently as a different group and a different price point for the units. And no uh, as a rule. No, that's usually going to be above. That that would be above those um, those levels. The HUD, the HUD Section 8 program is limited to 80% of the median, which is defined as low income. Uh, very low is 50% of the median. Extremely low is 35% of the median. Those three comprise the definition of affordable housing. Uh, workforce housing will allow you to go up to 140% of the median income for our county. If you have an affordable housing project, you're required to have a certain number of units in each of those income categories, right? Typically, or at least be qualified, everybody that's in this 80% or less of their or base or is qualified on an in, adjusted income that is less than 80% of the need. Matt, does it does work for, I mean, does affordable require some level of HUD where there's one force doesn't? Or well, typically, uh, affordable housing, in order to, to operate, it's going to require some kind of subsidy. Um, and typically, that comes in the form of Section 8, a project based Section 8 contract or a Section 8 voucher that is on the back of the individual tenant. And if that tenant moves out, then that voucher leaves also. Um, but to make the numbers work, you got to have some kind of government assistance helping the folks that you're required to rent to be able to pay the rent. Uh, that covers the cost of developing the property. Uh, typically, um, both the affordable and workforce housing programs these days use housing credits to basically write down the cost of the mortgage. Uh, it's not a direct subsidy. It's a subsidy essentially to the development process that allows the development to be created for less money than it would be in the free market. Even workforce is kind of funny. When we did the housing element, I did all the calculations to see what the price of that unit would be or that rent would be. And the rent for workforce was in the 900 range for Walton County. So that's, we don't really, I mean, we, the market really doesn't deliver that too much um, in South Walton. And we made that change um, in the housing element to define workforce housing for our bonuses. I don't know if you guys remember if you recall that. Um, so we have a series of density bonuses that are available for affordable housing and now workforce housing as well to try to open that up a bit. That's one of the changes that we've been working on. But there's a section in here that deals with. Where's that out of here? Um, it's section 1.1509. Well, this is the policy that I'm thinking about changing. Uh, 1.1509, uh, under, it's under minor development plan, plan on page 40, page 40 of your uh, chapter one draft. If you see uh, number four there, it says, and I have it highlighted, it says technical plans for affordable housing may be approved Conceptually, conceptually, by the board of county commissioners. So, could you explain, explain that? Well, I think what it means, and I'm not entirely sure, but I think what it means is that. Uh, 
is minors minors don't don't normally go to the board. Those are TRC. Um, I think this is forcing those to go to the board. I do too. Which I think is a good idea. You do. I do. Okay. Well, if, if that's but that's it, kind it, of decision. It wouldn't come here. It goes straight. To it goes straight to the mm -hmm. masters. Right, but it does penalize them. Um, you know, this could be changed to, to or we could delete it because we've kind of made that shift to workforce housing. Uh, but generally, there's another section in the, in the code that talks about fast-tracking affordable or workforce housing projects. So, in other words, if not having all that additional review and expense because it's Where they get review at? prevented for in the fast-tracking. The fast-tracking... Uh, it's very unclear um, what was intended, and, and I think that's what we got to do is decide: do we want to leave this? In, do we want them to go, or we don't want them to go? Do you want to incentivize that, or do you do you want to keep with that level of review, whatever? I like to understand what that process is. Yeah. And the reason I'm not be very specific, the reason I'm, I'm so interested in that is what came up in Mossy Head just a month or so. Ago. Where a commissioner was trying to get the county to give county land to, the, to somebody to build affordable housing, and it's prime land in the heart of Mossy Head. Mm -hmm. And if that don't have to go to the commissioners, that could prove someplace else. It takes the community completely out of that discussion. It does. And I don't want that to happen. Okay. And that, that's the problem with these fast track mm -hmm. mechanisms right. is most of the time they're fast tracking around the citizens. That's it. Uh, yes. and, and in that particular case, there was nobody who lives out there has any interest in that project going where she wanted it to go. And if they could have avoided that hearing before the BCC, mm -hmm. that could have happened yeah. without the citizens ever having an opportunity to, to see yeah. it. Yeah. And that breeds just intent. There was an upset people. Mm -hmm. So that uh, sounds like what I'm hearing is that you would prefer, I, I've got to fix this language so we know what it means. I think it least <laughs> has to be approved by the BCC. You would prefer maybe that they follow the same development yep, pattern I as do. other developments I do. and that there's no... I think the fast tracking should at least go to the BCC. I'm not even sure there should be a fast tracking, to be honest with you. I think that process needs to be wide open. Mr. Chairman, if I could, um, the way that is supposed to work, um, affordable housing is considered a conditional use but in the context of this affordable housing language that was put in there in 2008, I believe, seven or eight. Um, the intent was to take the project straight to the Board of County Commissioners conceptually and they agreed with the location and the general parameters of that, the kinds of things that you would consider in a conceptual approval. Uh, that they would approve that and then they would go back through the process as a minor development without regard to the size of the property. If they were doing 100 units, they'd go to the PCC first, they'd agree to the location and the general context and those details would typically be in conceptual and then they would authorize that project to fast track back as a minor development that would just go to the tech review committee, meet the requirements and then go to development. But it would have to start at the BCC first for the authorization, which is where they could decide, is this the right spot for that? Is this the right developer for this? Is this the right approach for providing affordable housing in this neighborhood? No, let, me, let me just focus out. It seems to me that that was put in in seven or eight, like 10 years, and we really have I mean, everybody agrees that we need affordable workforce housing, but we really haven't developed any in the last 10 years. So the, the provision, the fast track around, basically around the community, mm -hmm. hasn't really helped us. So why not just let it do up the rest of it? I, mean, I agree. Well, we have a housing assistance plan that's been adopted by the Board of County Commissioners that provides for expedited permitting as one of the strategies to deliver affordable housing. The BCC approves this plan every three years, and they have for the last 15. Um, and expedited permitting is one of those things that the state strongly encourages for delivery of, of, of affordable housing uh, so it can certainly get to the market in time for the folks that actually need to live there. Um, 
Mac, I understand that, but I think the concern is that if there's a process in place that takes the community out of that process. And that would not take the community out of the process. I would, I would like to I'd like to see a requirement that a community hearing be held. And just and let the community it, have it. There is a requirement with I mean it has to go to the board for that conceptual improvement and approve I mean we just leave it like it is because there is that requirement that it goes to the board. It doesn't come to you but it goes to the board. It's me or not. Well, I think the community has to have the opportunity <laughs> so to have input. After, after the conceptual hearing, then there will be a community input? Uh, no. 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 Not once the Board of County Commissioners. I mean, uh, there will be a public hearing at that point. So I've got to agree with Ted. I think it should go to the community. As a, as a in, in the real world, the Board of County it may not get out in public, right? And, and especially in, in out of the way places like Gaskin, where we have to pump our news in. So, so which there's no there's no sewer in Gaskin, so we're not having no subdivision. But the but you know what? There's no the sewer in Mossy yet either. We're almost dead. So, I mean, you got a point there. But it really hasn't helped. I mean, well, one of the reasons it hadn't helped is the economy tank, and all of a sudden, a whole bunch of housing became affordable because they weren't any people to rent or buy. Um, and that provided the opportunity uh, in South County for large developers to come in and buy up subdivisions that were finished or almost finished, but no houses built. They bought those for pennies on the dollar and then put a product on there that what didn't cost as much as the product they would have otherwise had to build there to recover the money. So. The economy tanking has sort of taken the air out of the need for affordable housing, but now that the economy is back, um, we got to figure out where the people that serve the tables and you know cut the grass and um, uh, the the middle of the and Freeport. I, I just don't want to do anything that would hinder the public's opportunity to be involved in that process. And I certainly concur with that. The, um, I, Just for clarification, though, that one hearing at Board of County Commissioners would require notice to people within 300 feet of both sides, just like any major. You know how many people that would be in Mossy Hill on that particular site that she was proposing? Uh, Zero. Zero. Maybe three or four? Uh, given the location of where it is, we've got Blackstone on one side, the fire station on the other side, the park, and the school. So yeah, you're so probably right. Zero. We'd be notifying ourselves. So, I mean, and that's, that's the concern. That's my concern. Because... Well, I, don't, I don't think any of us want to, to put something that the citizens don't want. Exactly. Um, I mean, I think the citizens have to have input. In a site like that, zero citizens are going to be notified. Uh, so how do you make it? Can you make it where you could, you have to have a notice for a community? That's Me, can that. you can you put that in there somewhere where they would have uh -huh. to be a have to be noticed well, for a community the outside of 300 foot? I, regular I know development process. I mean, it would it would be the regular. I mean, we're 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 taking steps to um, get our developments online and to have uh, like an email list where people can sign up and get notices. In addition to the notice, I mean, that's about all you can do. One thing that I do know is that and Heather may have information on this is that if that age is part of the Fair Housing um, Act and so uh, denial of affordable housing projects that are within the code and comprehensive plan has come under challenge in different local governments. I've heard I've been briefed on this quite a bit at different trainings that if it meets the requirements of the code the comp plan and the board and we deny it based on public concern that we can't get uh, so fair you housing. You can be sued just for turning the wrong way. Don't right, it's yeah, I mean, it's just something to be aware of. Oh, I understand you know, it's, But it's I'm saying I, just, I think it's critical we do everything we can yeah. to inform the public and we'll give them their opportunity to have input in the process. That's, that's, and I think, in, and since that side is what we're talking about and the way that side sits, I mean, the 300 feet, no one gets notified. I think that you have to have something to ensure that those people that are going to be affected by it do get notified. Well, one of the things I know would be a standard 
public hearing signs for five long measure elements in addition that I understand your point. Some way you can require some sort of community maintenance. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. If there's no substantial three hundred feet, you could say we're going to have a community meeting before we go. I just I don't know. I don't know. That makes that may not be practical. Yeah, I mean we just I think that we're tasked with uh, cleaning up and making sure that it makes sense and that we know what we're doing. And there is a fast track section. And, Sounds like we probably want to tailor that to building permitting, not the development review process. And we want to have them go through the regular public hearing process just like any other development. That sounds like mm -hmm. what I'm hearing. That's what I would prefer. Well, I thought you would really just want to make sure that the community was I think there. But that's the only way they're going to be. I mean, I don't know. And I don't know how, in that process they would be. Yeah, but because even if they go through the process like that, they're only not, your notification is still 300 feet. In. Yes, sir. So you're not so, is there a way to expand that for for that type of development? I don't know that we can stay out of the courts with making it harder to develop affordable housing and expand it out in the farm. I don't think it necessarily makes it harder. I think you, you just, the community that's going to be affected has to be notified. They're imposing the page more yes. stringent public notice requirement on affordable housing than a standard apartment complex or, or subdivision. I don't think would stand a legal test. Can you can you have a a public meeting like that and still fast track it after that? that we could certainly do that. Yeah. I mean, public yeah. meeting is not an unreasonable yeah. idea at all. If you're trying to encourage, uh, that's what I want. I want to make sure the public has the opportunity to view and to see and to have them. So well, that to me is critical. You yeah. do the fast track process here. You just require that they have a public meeting. Right. Well, and, and just to give you a little bit of background on the development of affordable housing, these things take years to put together. If you're going to layer various uh, sources of, of financing, if you're going to use housing credits, the housing credit process is usually about a three-year process to get from the end, beginning to the end, and then you get to go to the local government and make your application to actually build it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but that is part of the thinking behind having the expedited permitting where you come and get at least a preliminary approval from the Board of County Commissioners, the ultimate approval authority, and then you go back and you push your project financing together. Uh, so when you've got that together, you can come back through the pipeline on an expedited permitting basis and get your project out of the ground. Uh, I just um, think the, the, in the real, the real world, and, and we're talking about yeah. specific, it, in the real world, goal is to have affordable housing and workforce housing. We all know that we don't get businesses to come unless that happens. So, but in the case, in that specific case, had we had some sort of community meeting first, we would have known that wasn't going to fly with that community. So we, we wouldn't have been wasting time and resources that could be spent somewhere else. Yeah. I mean, I, my and, and it would have been a well, just here. Quite honestly, Commissioner, after developing sort of the for 25 years, I've never been to a community meeting where they embrace the developer. That's bring the affordable housing to town. I can tell you what the outcome of that community meeting will be. Everybody will become informed, but you won't have but maybe a couple of people and it's probably the landowner. I've been in a meeting where the landowner said I'm supporting the product because he's going to sell it to the developer that I was representing. Um, and no one else in that room was interested. Um, because number one, with affordable housing, everybody thinks the worst. That, kind of, that term has, has developed a negative connotation. Just well, there's like, reasons for just that. Like the and there are reasons for that. Just like the original program, HUD uh, program is called low rent housing. Mm -hmm. You know, and then that became a, a piece of jargon that had a very negative connotation and was used you know, and what would have been social media back in those days, before social media. <laughs> it would have been on Facebook. Yeah, some of the negative in today's right. context. But now workforce housing doesn't share those to an extent. Because you're talking about a, a, a firefighter, a teacher, mm -hmm. police officer, those houses, those, those homes. Not subsidized. Yes, but let me, get, let me share something with you. How much does a teacher make when they come to work for Walton County? 
above what they're less than thirty five thousand dollars. That qualifies if you're trying to support a family on thirty five thousand dollars, you're absolutely qualified for another section eight. Yep. 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 So, I mean, our teachers qualify for government assistance to help them pay their rent because of how little we pay them. Um, our firefighters start about the same range. Police officers, sheriff's department, deputies, man, if they're the only house, the only way to turn in the household, they qualify for Section 8, deep subsidy yep. on day one. You know, that's the, the start of reality of this. Uh -huh. It's not just workforce housing. Uh, they qualify for affordable housing. And that's, and that's the place of our problem. We need places for those folks to live. I certainly agree with you that, I mean, affordable housing over the years has, when most people think of that, you think of the concrete block building that's got 12 to 20 units in it, it's two story, it's got a clothesline out back, and people standing on the corner selling crack. Yep. That's the perception of affordable housing, and years you ago, you don't build that kind of and when the government's involved, that's typically what you got. That's right. Um, I, I, was, I was in Savannah this weekend, we went through uh, and found <laughs> Not looking for that, we were looking for a place to eat, but we ran into one and it looked pretty nice. But it, well, you know, it, but it had a sign out front, that's all you could identify. Go back out there about midnight. That's the truth. I but, I mean, the artist that she made her in Phoenix Springs, that's an example of what we want. Uh, that's workforce housing. It has affordable housing units inside it, but you can't go in there and find them unless you know where they are. Or you have a list. And if you don't know what that apartment complex is, you think it's a standard market rate apartment complex. It's controlled access, got a wrong iron fence all the way around it. Uh, it's got a swimming pool. It looks and acts like market rate housing. That's when affordable housing is successful. That's the model we want. Not the that you started to be responsible for Oakdale Gardens in the Phoenix Springs years ago, along with about 10,000 other apartments. Um, but that's what we want, not the old style public housing. You were you were probably on part of when the arbors came and, and that was fault, if I remember correctly. The arbors were absolutely fault tooth and nail. People did not want that there. Uh, and then look what we got. I knew what was coming, and I knew what the opposition would be, and I knew what people would say, and when he kept me uh, about Mossy Head, um, that's absolutely what I expected to hear, um, because that is what you do here. Everybody thinks the worst, and nobody wants it next to them. Well, and it makes sense in different areas, and some areas it don't make sense. In Mossy Head, there ain't no job for people to go to. I, I agree that that... No grocery true. store, no drug store, no nothing. And it needs to be near services. That's right. Um, it absolutely does. Uh, it needs to be in an urban area or a suburban area. Um, not, not 30 miles from the job. It can't be out away from the necessary services uh, because if people don't have cars, they need to be able to walk to work. I think we've got Jack Kirsten's <coughs> meeting here, so let's. Yeah, we shouldn't have anything. Yeah, I mean, policy of near this section. It is, uh, to me, difficult to know if something's consistent with the code and the comprehensive plan at a conceptual level. So, you know, the board making an approval decision at a conceptual level like that, you know, on affordable housing, which is fraught with, you know, all kinds of issues on it, it probably, uh, you know, go through the regular process or totally fast track it uh, one or the other, um, depending on, you know, and I think that's right, they've come a long way. And a lot of times you can integrate affordable or workforce housing or even affordable housing into larger developments and you wouldn't even know it's based on housing typology. Maybe you have a that's a way to do it. That is, absolutely. And we have a lot of density bonuses that are geared at doing that. And I can see people using those in, in the mid-county. Mid that probably hasn't worked out financially in South Walton. 
Um, but it could work out there. Um, so there, there's that. And I think that's one of the of the 331 project that we've been working on, and this has been expressed to me, is to create that, at least have a mix of housing types that people um, could afford, have those integrated into other housing. And, um, but we can do two things. We can say they follow the regular approval process, or we can leave this like it is, and they come conceptually to the board and they're a minor, because that's what this means, and then make the fast track section jive with whatever decision we make. I would prefer to see the regular process. It's not going to happen quick either way you do it because of all the work that goes into it. That's my opinion. I mean, the other thing that, that could be done if we wanted to still have a public notice, but we wanted to incentivize that instead of the density broke bonus approach, you can exempt them from the fees. That's the other option. Um, these are things that we're going to have to look at, I think, on the 331 plan. We're going to definitely have to look at yeah, it. Are you talking about developers who are going who are building a project? <coughs> they're going to make money. It's not like they're not giving these things away. I mean, why are why you exempt them from fees? Well, I'm curious. Typically, there's a crime for the nonprofit these days, and the Board of County Commissioners has given us a policy that says if they are bought by a nonprofit and they have request a waiver on their letter, that I understand. I would, I would rather waive the fees for yeah. affordable housing than, than fast for that. I think waiving the fees is appropriate. Yeah. Let's say you had a big mixed use development come in on 331 and they had a, a regular component, but they also had an affordable component. You could wait, you can incentivize them doing that by saying for that affordable or workforce component, you don't have to pay your mitigation fees. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I think that I agree with a lot that. better than saying. Yeah, they, they're, everybody's talking about doing that, so I'm trying to figure out well, what are the ways that you can really make that happen because our current density bonus thing really hasn't been working. Uh, nobody's used it. Uh, it's basically not working. Yeah. And nobody really wants a bunch of density anyway, so mm -hmm. that may be. Well, we, could, we could try the, the fee approach and see if that would incentivize some more workforce. I mean, that would, it's worth a try. I mean, what's, what we're doing ain't working. Typically, these days, just for information, affordable housing developers um, make most of their money operating in the apartment complex once it's built. They're building it for a minimum fee revenue stream um, and some amount of credit, tax credits at the beginning. But affordable housing developers uh, hope to at least break even on the development and then make some money on the back end operating. I mean, it's not, it, and it's hard, as we were just discussing, to be approved. So, giving them a break on the fees would help them to break even on the front end, and then. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, some of our fees down here for projects can be in the $200,000 range. The strings that come attached with the uh, state housing incentive program, and the ship funds that we get every year out of dock stamps, we've gotten, I mean, the minimum allocation for county our size is about $350,000 per year. We would have gotten more than a million dollars this year had the legislature not swept all the money out of the housing fund. It's amazing how they do that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Liz. Uh, and we spend every dollar of that every year. West Florida Regional Planning Council is our, our implementing contractor. Uh, and those dollars are they're very competitive because we've got more than a year waiting list for each of those strategies. Um, but, uh, the money does get to the use. Do you need a motion on this, Kristen? Uh, yes, I, and uh, I think the direction that I have is to subject them to a normal development review process, um, consider using fees as an incentive, and uh, uh, make sure that the fast track permit, fast track process is codified towards the building permit stage, not the 
uh, development review stage where the public notices. Is that correct? I make that motion. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. No second. Uh, okay. Give a motion a second. Any other discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. Okay, great. Okay, the last thing uh, on chapter one is to talk about the land clearing permit. Um, current, and I actually talked to the board about this under um, the chapter four discussion. And currently, our land development code really doesn't talk about land clearing permits at all, except for if you're in a coastal new land protection zone. So we need to either not issue those permits or codify that permit process because um, we're kind of doing the permitting without the, the authority. Um, so we added um, a section in here dealing with land clearing permits, and this is important because the South Walton land clearing permit requirement is that you have a building permit or a development order in play. So in other words, you cannot get a presumptive clearing permit or a, uh, like a permit for purposes of selling land or anything like that. You have to actually have a development plan to get that permit. And there are many reasons for that, mainly dealing with um, the, the preservation that we have down here and the coastal new land protection zone and all of the things that people get in trouble with down here without a formal development plan are a little bit different than the rest of the county. So, but for the north part of the county, you could do the presumptive clearing. It's a $25 permit, um, and we will just notify you at, during that permit stage of things like, you know, the buffering requirements, and you didn't clear it out and have to put it back, or um, any environmental considerations. So, right now, if I want to go out and clear five or ten acres to put a field in, i got to get a permit. That's, that's currently what we do. Yeah. Um, we do issue those permits right now. Um, yeah, it's just not a code. <laughs> we do issue those permits. What if someone does it without a permit? What do you do? Usually we require them to get a retroactive permit. It's a $25. It's not a big deal and not a big time constraint and and really it just lets them know most of the time what happens is they may clear their agricultural buffer which is expensive for them to have to put back in but they didn't know about it and so the permit process at least lets them know about it so it's protected in that way um, and most people ask us for those permits because they don't want to get in that situation where they've taken something out that what's the agricultural buffer there is a um, section in our uh, comp plan that requires you to have a buffer near an agricultural, agricultural, a bona fide farming operation. And honestly, I'm not sure that um, that's valid anymore because there is a state statute that pretty much exempts all of agriculture from our land development code. And we don't even permit really in ag. So, <laughs> which is the majority of the law. So if I wanted to go out and clear 10 acres to put a, uh, put a pasture in, I don't have to have a permit, because that's a That's correct. Thing. You do not have to have, in, in ag, or the, the language exempts ag and general agriculture, so you don't have to have a permit. And, I mean, and tree farming and things like that are We're exempt, right, right. But if you're like in rural village or something like that, you it, you would have to get uh, a permit. A law permit. Yeah, and usually they do them with their building permit. It's like a one-time deal, you know. And then we let them know about you know clearing parameters. I know it's good like that. And we need to have it in the code before we do it. <laughs> I think so. Yeah, I don't really see it being a huge change from what's going on. <laughs> it's just yeah. gonna be the code. Except for South Carolina, that is a huge change. That they would have to have a, a that's a huge change. I don't mean I don't want to downplay that, but that's a huge change. So the bay is the dividing line. That's right. And it, and that really is a response to the code enforcement issues that we have constantly down here, because if someone clears down here a code enforcement is called. And um, nine times out of ten they've taken out something that you know, if they take out a preservation area, you know, 
hard. But you, you can put it back. You can't really you can't add put it back. Is, you can't put back what they took out. Exactly. Man, man that's why we're here for that to grow. So, is there an acreage requirement on the land clearing for a permit or no? No. In any property. Mm -hmm. So, if you got a half acre and you want to clear it off, and there's no agricultural concerns around it, you still got to get a twenty dollar five dollar permit. Mm -hmm. For what consideration if there's no agricultural considerations? Well, if you're you don't have to get a permit. Yeah, but it's if you're not. Either residential or. Uh, permit is considered an adjunct of construction and land building code today. Um, and it means you're about to build something because you're clearing in preparation for it and all that requires a permit of some kind. Um, you can't get a clearing permit in advance of getting your development order or your construction permit in those locations. Um, in South Wall, they're eating us up. I mean, real estate brokers are going out and clearing land to, and speculation so to make it more saleable. Sure. Uh, in the meantime, we've got um, a destabilization of that particular site. We've got erosion runoff. Uh, a portion of the natural stormwater system, the vegetation is gone, so more water runs off than otherwise would have. So your Chinese would end all that? Yes. We have effectively already done that. We just got to find the permit process. Right. But, but, uh, but right, so that if it's not in code, that's a well, we we're clarifying in the code now. It has always been there. Um, when I first started back in the last decade, that was the policy. You didn't get a clearing permit without a development or a building permit. Once you got those, then you could go to the environmental and get your clearing permit. But north of the bay, that doesn't apply. Well, that's what I'm saying. Actually, it has always applied. It hasn't actually applied as much north of the bay as south of the bay. What we're trying to do is give some relief in the three tiers north of the bay uh, and have the most stringent regulation in South County where we have our most environmentally sensitive land and where we have regulations in place to protect certain vegetated communities. Uh, and, and the only, the only, uh, Loophole is the ag, which none of the south end is. There's no, there's, there's, very, there's a, a small amount in the Bay Walls that can plan, but that's. And, and that's actually north of the international. Yeah. So there's no ag, that's all up there. And, and the fossil, do we do intend to add language dealing with restoration plans, like when someone clears the coastal dune lake buffer? Um, because right now we have no guidance in the code on restoration plans or anything. So staff needs, I mean, we need to know what to do and apply it consistently every time um, instead of just being, you know, kind of, you know, we, we don't even know what to tell, we don't even have the code to tell them what to put back in there. How much does yeah. the permit cost in South Wall? $25. I think we should do it. I agree with you. Okay. So, do you need a motion for that? That's in here. So, if you uh, go ahead and adopt and move the language here, that is in here. The other things were not in here because uh, I really didn't know what to do with that. Um, so, that that's really it. Those are the serious things in here in chapter one. So, uh, everything else is kind of clean up. You know, we made reference to zoning instead of land use. We um, made some change. And again, I think Heather may have some additional legal changes to the um, public hearing quasi-judicial legislative that's changing with lawsuits and stuff. So we're trying to keep up. <laughs> I have some changes. Okay. And that's probably to those sections and to the board section just yeah, it's, it's, I don't think it's going to be um, anything substantive that's changing the process. It's more uh, technical language. Yeah, okay. So if you're okay with that, we'll take our language and move it to the board. Mm -hmm. So that's it uh, on Chapter 1. If you want to go, we'll need two motions, one for Chapter 1 and one for Chapter 3, which is next. We do have the one. Yes. We do have some public here. You want to bring them to the one right now? I forgot to go to the board.
We have a motion to. Motion to approve. We have a motion to approve. We have a second. Okay. Melissa, do you want to say anything? Thank you.